Hello, my name is Michelle. I'm a librarian at the Gosstown Public Library. I'm so happy you decided to join us today for an intimate hi history of medieval cooking with Alison Zabo. She's a local author who has written um, several books, uh, it's novels, as well as this uh, cookbook that we're promoting today, The Reenactor's Cookbook. She's got some fun anecdotes and recipes to share with you today. I'm going to give her the reins. Okay. Hello, everyone. Am I here? Okay, looks like I am. So I'm Allison, and I am the author of the Reenactors Cookbook, and I am here to talk tonight about medieval cooking and medieval life and about the cookbook itself and to go over a recipe from the cookbook, in fact. Um, I decided I would get dressed up in my, uh, my gear and show off a little bit of what I would have looked like and how I spend my summers, in fact, because this cookbook was born from me doing Renaissance fairs and SCA events where I dress like this for days on end, camp in a canvas tent and cook over an open fire. <laughs> so you can see I have long sleeves, I have layers. There's actually a uh, underwear layer, a dress layer, an overdress layer, <laughs> and uh, it's actually very, very warm. I have a coif underneath, and then this is a veil on top. And I'm actually going to take the veil off because it interferes with the modern headphones, which I'm going to put on so that I sound better in a couple of minutes. But I thought I'd show you guys what it looked like. And also because it was a Christmas gift from my mistress in my uh, Renaissance Fair family. And uh, she hand beaded the edges and everything. So it was really special. And she had veil pins made for me, which I don't know if you guys can see. Let's see if I can get it on the white. They're these tiny, tiny little pins that are used to hold the veils in place so that they don't come off because they didn't have buttons and safety pins. So it was pretty intense. And it'll just take me a second to get this off. There's one more here. There it is. And this is what my coif looks like. I look like a milkmaid. <laughs> With the headphones on, you should have a little bit better sound with me, and then I can take over. All right. Are we good? Let me see. We are Good. I am now going to attempt to um, share my screen, or I will in a moment. Um, one of the things that I was talking about was um, sharing a recipe from my cookbook. This is actually my author's copy, but you guys should be able to get it in a library in a few weeks. Um, it has, I think, about 100 recipes in it that range from uh, things like uh, barley gruel and let's see, garlic soup, to cucumber salad, to rabbit in syrup, and a bunch of other things. And they're mostly based on historical recipes that were written between the early 1400s and the late 1500s. And a lot of those recipes are available online today. You can go and look at them on uh, various museum websites and, and the like, but they're difficult to understand because they say things along the lines of um, uh, hew ye into gobbets ye beef, <laughs> which is very much not a descriptive sort of thing. It, it doesn't have, the, the early recipes don't have a lot of um, amounts or uh, or anything like that. They don't tell you which specific spices to use. They'll tell you one or two, but they used, in fact, much larger uh, um, cadre of spices than we use today. North Americans kind of were salt, pepper, maybe some garlic powder. You might have lemon pepper. The medieval spice range is massive and it contains hundreds. And I actually, in the back of the book, I have listings of some of the most common spices that were used throughout the Middle Ages. And I have an actual box that I carry with me to events, which has all the different herbs and, 
and powders in them. And I, I absolutely adore using it. It looks beautiful. You'll see a picture of it uh, when I bring the recipe up. So I think what I'm going to do is start with the recipe and then work my way forward from there. Ah, did spice, uh, yes, hold on, let me pull that open, there we go. Yes, uh, spices did differ based on a family's wealth. So by the 14th century, which is 1500 and onwards, you, most people could afford small amounts of salt, pepper, um, not so much long peppers, which were from the Middle East, but um, things like cubebs, were grown in England and in Spain, and they came over to England very easily. Cubeb is something I use a lot of. It has all of the flavor of a pepper and no heat. So if you have a kid who doesn't like the spiciness of pepper, but you want the flavor, cubebs are a great answer to that. And I use it in my modern cooking all the time. Um, things like saffron have always been expensive, but you also don't need a lot of them. So I have a, a recipe for oxtail soup and it calls for three threads of saffron. <laughs> it's such a minute and minuscule amount um, that you, you're, not, you're using such a small amount that most people who were in um, uh, towns and cities and larger metropolises would have had access to the majority of spices, especially those on the coasts. People on the inner sides, people who were largely farmers and peasants, maybe not. But even there, salt and basic peppers were pretty much available by 14th century. Um, of course, when you get into the royalty and the people with the crowns and the fancy embroidery and stuff, you end up with lots and lots of interesting things. They put lead into their wine to make it taste better um, because lead is very sweet uh, and all sorts of other cool things like that, which we don't do today. <laughs> um, so the recipe that I made, and I actually made it for my family last night and took pictures because my kitchen is not set up in a way that I can do a live video while I'm cooking. And everything takes longer than an hour to cook because these recipes were made before anything was processed. So everything is made from scratch and it takes a long time. Um, so we're going to be doing roasted chicken with fruit. And let's see if I can get it to, there we go, show up on the screen for a moment. And it's on page 50 if you go looking for it. I'm going to see if I can get my screen to share. I want to share an application. I want to share a Chrome tab. That one. Sorry for the chit chat. <laughs> and the presentation should start. And let's go full screen. All right. So this is the roasted chicken with fruit. And the reason that I picked this as a recipe to share with you was that it's very easy. And unlike some of the medieval recipes, it's actually fairly, um, it doesn't, it doesn't taste really odd. It's a little sweeter than most people go for these days, but it doesn't taste like really weird. So I can, my kids love it. The ingredients that I used in this, this is the actually in my kitchen. I had a six pound chicken. I had uh, an apple, an orange, a carrot, a turnip, some Napa cabbage, uh, the mission figs, apricots, raisins, cranberries, and wine. Uh, and I used apple juice. I usually use cider, but I didn't have any with me. And I had an onion in there. Uh, you can actually use pretty much any dried fruits or fresh fruits that you want. Um, you just layer them in and you'll see that as I go through the recipe. But you're looking for, this is kind of a little sweeter um, than you might normally do for a, a dinner meal. This is my beautiful spice box, which locks, which is very appropriate for the Middle Ages because spices were considered to be very um, precious. Uh, I had uh, salt and pepper. I used telecorny long peppers. They come from Spain. I used cloves. I used cubebs. I used a little bit of saffron, some herbs de Provence, 
uh, which herbs de Provence did not exist in the Middle Ages, but all of the herbs that are in it were, and they were frequently used in that combination. But the actual term herbs de Provence was created, I think, by Julia Child. <laughs> it's a modern thing. And poudre fort, which means strong powder, and it was a very ubiquitous spice mix that includes uh, cinnamon, nutmeg, um, some pepper, and a bunch of other things. And it's it's kind of a very fun, not very spicy, but peppery flavored thing. So I'm cooking in a great big cast iron pot because this is what I would cook in over the fire if I were cooking in. If I were doing this at a fair, I probably would have used bacon in the bottom. I would have cooked the bacon until it coated the bottom with the grease. But as I was doing it at home, I decided to opt for a little bit of canola oil because that works just fine too. Um, if you take care of your cast iron, it looks like this all the time. And I will say this, cast iron gets used at least once a week in my house. I'm constantly cooking bread in it or chicken or whatever else and it's a ton of fun to cook with and it gets that nice smooth coating on it that nothing sticks to. I added in my chicken and to give you an idea of how large that pot is, that's a six pound chicken. It was not small. <laughs> um, it happened to be uh, a whole chicken because that's what I wanted to do for this because it looks nice. But you can actually do this with chicken pieces as well. I would cook it a little less long in pieces, but I like the way that it looks when it cooks in, in uh, as a whole chicken. Because I didn't want to put the stuffing on the inside because then you guys wouldn't have seen it, I decided to just stick an onion inside um, and then I put the ingredients around it. But you can actually stuff the chicken with the mix you just mix it all up and then stuff it in I layered it pretty so that you guys could see and follow along so the first thing that went into the bottom of my pot was the onions and if I had been putting in leek and garlic I would have put that in in the, in the bottom layer as well that's about two onions worth and it goes all the way around my chicken I put in carrots um, I don't know how many of you, I shop at Market Basket and they have these massive, huge carrots that are like the size of a small child. Those are wonderful. They are not medieval. Medieval carrots were actually yellow or black most of the time. And the orange carrot didn't become popular until the 17 and 1800s. Um, but orange carrot is what I had on hand and it's probably what you have on hand. When you're chopping, this is a rough chop. You don't need to do anything special to it. It can be as big or as small as you want. Sometimes I cut them into coins and sometimes I cut them into little like matchsticks. It depends on where I'm cooking it and how I'm cooking it. I decided that half coins would work well for this particular meal. I added in my apples next and I would have added pears if I'd had one. Um, I leave the skin on my fruit because it stops it from falling apart because Otherwise, it kind of turns to applesauce in the bottom of the pot, which is fine. It tastes delicious, but it doesn't look as nice. I only used one apple because that was all I felt that it really needed. We all like cabbage, and cabbage is a very medieval thing to put in to any meal. <laughs> they lived on cabbage, onions, and turnips a lot of the time, so... Um, I had Napa cabbage, but you could put in any kind. And I, when I'm cooking it in a dish like this, where it's going to be cooking in liquid, you want to cook it in large chunks so it doesn't completely disappear into the bottom. Um, so you can see the, the large wedges there. And um, so I just sort of distributed it around my chicken. Here I've added in uh, dried figs, which I've quartered. And I took one orange and pulled it apart and put it in. And a couple of the pieces of uh, segments of orange broke while I was doing it. So I actually rubbed those over the skin of the chicken to add a little bit of flavor in. Just a note, medieval recipes that call for oranges also usually call for an awful lot of sugar. And the reason that they do that is that medieval oranges were what we today call Seville oranges. And they were not sweet. They were actually more like a lemon almost because they didn't have the amount of sugar. That's a new thing which we have bred into our modern oranges. 
the flavor of Seville oranges um, can be experienced if you go to the store and you look for um, one of the higher quality uh, orange marmalades. Look for the, the Seville orange marmalade and you can get a taste for it. They're very nice, but they're not sweet. Um, and I decided that I wasn't going to add sugar. I was adding in my oranges, so I went with modern oranges. And then I added in my dried fruit. Um, I am strongly of the opinion that you cannot add too much dried fruit to this recipe. Dried fruit makes the bulk of it, and it's very appropriate to this type, uh, to this time of year from a medieval cooking perspective. You could take a chicken or a small uh, guinea fowl or a duck or any kind of um, bird and cook it at this time of year from a medieval, uh, medieval people would have done that. Um, but they wouldn't have had a lot of fresh fruit. They might have had apples and pears because apples and pears can be kept in a cellar, um, but they probably wouldn't have had any berries or peaches or things like that. The squishier fruits tend to go off very quickly. Um, and so dried fruit is what they would have had. And so that's what we used in this. So I had regular raisins and I had dried cranberries. I also used uh, apricots, which I think are going to show up in the next thing. Nope, there's, there's my spices. I also used dried apricots and I had the figs in there. I hand grind all of my spices. And the reason that I do this is that a freshly ground uh, spice mix is very aromatic and the flavors infuse your meat and your vegetables much more effectively than using dry pre-made powdered herbs. You can tell this just from the moment when you're sitting and grinding it up. And I can tell you last night, my whole kitchen smelled like cardamom and cloves and herbs de Provence, and it was wonderful. The, um, the mortar and pestle that I use is actually made of granite. It's rough on the inside so that when you're grinding the spices, they um, they actually powder up instead of bouncing around inside. And you can see I was able to uh, do a fairly good job of getting that down into a very um, even powder. And it only took me about three, four minutes of, of work to get to that point. The oils, the natural oils that are in herbs that are whole, uh, like peppers and um, grains of paradise and things like this actually are released when you hand grind them and that's one of the reasons why they infuse your meat better. Um, I added the spice mix to the top of the chicken and just sort of rubbed it on and then added um, the various liquids that I was using. I used a mix of Chardonnay, apple juice, and a little bit of chicken broth. Again, it's what I had on hand. You can do this with water, I have. Uh, you just don't end up with as tasty a broth, but not everybody's interested in eating the broth, so that's very, um, it's up to you how you wanna do it. You want the water or the liquid in it to be up enough, you can just see it, um, if you look at the bottom wing of the chicken, you can just see the liquid there. You don't wanna drown the chicken, but you want it to be deep enough that it keeps the chicken moist and distributes the flavors throughout. And also that liquid will keep it from sticking to the bottom of your pot. Now, you can cook this at 350 in the oven. If you do, and you're using cast iron like I do, you have to take the rack out of your oven because most of those metal racks cannot handle the 15 pounds of cast iron plus six pounds of chicken plus two pounds of other assorted vegetables and it just falls <laughs> which is not really very useful so i take them all out and just put it carefully on the bottom but that is not a very strong piece of metal in the bottom of most ovens and so you have to be careful when you're cooking over a fire it's actually a lot easier <laughs> you can either um this particular pot has legs and so you can pull coals underneath it and set it in the coals and put coals over the top and your base that's basically why it was an oven it acts as an oven and it's called a dutch oven um, on the other hand if you want to cook it hanging that's pretty much the same as doing it on your stovetop 
I have a gas stove because I like cooking with fire. And so I had cooked it partway in the oven just to get it started. And also because I was doing things with the stove top at the time and I, <laughs> I needed to get the chicken cooking, but I wasn't ready to put it up top. And then I moved it up to the top and I had it on the lowest gas heat and I would just put it at a one uh, or whatever your lowest is. Um, I have a very sturdy lid, as you could see in the previous thing. It fits very tightly in there, and that's a good thing. It holds the moisture inside the chicken, um, inside the pot, and it sort of recirculates and bastes it as it's cooking. Uh, I usually only check, about, check on it about once an hour for the first couple of hours, and then after that, I will check every 15 minutes because I don't want it to overcook. You don't want it to completely turn into stew because if you leave it in long enough, it will actually completely fall apart. I have done that over fires at events, um, but that's not the goal in this. You want to have a finished chicken. You do want to keep this covered while it's cooking because it keeps the moisture in and it helps the oils get into the skin and into the meat itself. So, for a six pound turkey or a chicken, um, I usually cook poultry for about 20 minutes per pound at 350. This was six pounds, so two hours. I ended up giving it three hours because I wanted it to be well done, but not overdone. When the legs are falling off, when you go in and you kind of poke at the leg and it comes off, it's ready. <laughs> um, in Modern cooking, we would consider that overdone, but in medieval cooking, they didn't have digital thermometers to tell people when things were done. They didn't have pop-up timers in their chicken. And so you wanted to make sure it was thoroughly cooked. And the moist cooking, the cooking in the liquid, actually helps it stay nice and tender, even though you're cooking it for a longer period of time. And if you look at this picture, you can actually see that the raisins and the uh, cranberries have puffed up and they do that. It's wonderful. Uh, everything gets soft and mixes together and the flavors blend beautifully. This chicken came apart so easily I didn't use a knife. <laughs> I had a pair of metal tongs and I pulled the legs off with the tongs and they came right off and I just put them on the platter and then I started pulling off the breast meat and it left all the bones behind and the entire, all of the meat just came right off, um, which was very nice. My family had a good choice of what kind of meat. I happen to like dark meat. Most of the rest of them like breast meat. It worked off nicely. Um, obviously, if you're cooking this with pieces of chicken as opposed to a whole chicken, it's going to come out easier and I would reduce the cooking time. Um, I wouldn't go over that 20 minutes per pound uh, simply because you might run into it being overcooked, especially if it's um, boneless. Boneless meat cooks quicker and it dries out very quickly, whereas bone-in, you can be a bit more um, lax about the timing. This was the stuffing that I pulled out um, and I just put it into a big bowl and people served. Uh, the mix of the fruits and the vegetables was very tasty. Um, there was a strong um, pepper, but it was also sweet from uh, some cardamom that I had put in there as well. I happened to serve this with wild rice. Um, Middle Ages, they didn't have potatoes. Um, so you might be thinking, and when I made this for Thanksgiving for my mother-in-law, I made it with potatoes because we all eat potatoes. Trying to serve up a meal that was a traditional 14th century English meal, um, I went with a wild rice mix, uh, which isn't exactly spot on, but it's fairly close. By the middle of the 14th century, rice was available through most parts of England and the coastal areas of Scotland. Um, and Rice is a wonderful way to soak up the juices. They're so delicious. I made a gravy because I happen to like gravy on my meat. Gravy of this type, which is made with a roux, is not period correct for the medieval period. Um, I 
just love gravy though, so <laughs> that's why I ended up doing it. Um, I mixed together rice flour and tapioca flour and then added that into the pot and stirred it until it was thick. Um, in the medieval times, to make a gravy, what they actually would have done was take uh, breadcrumbs, which parts of the bread, because when you bake in a bake oven as a, with a fire as opposed to in a regular oven, you always end up with burnt parts. It's unavoidable. Those were grated off and turned into breadcrumbs, and they would put them into sauces to make it thicker. This is my, my lovely plate just before I ate my dinner. Uh, I added salt at the table. There wasn't any salt put into the meal as I cooked it um, because part of my family has hypertension and from a modern perspective you want to do that, but also because um, medieval people didn't really cook with, with salt. Salt could be added at table um, and salt was used for preserving, but it wasn't cooked with the way that we do. It wouldn't occur to them to put a handful of salt into boiling water, for instance. It just wasn't done because it wasn't as popular. This was a very hearty meal, um, and we all ate to foundering. <laughs> so when I'm cooking over an open fire, this is what it looks like um, at some fairs. Generally speaking, raised uh, fire pits were not the norm. However, because of today's uh, fire regulations, a lot of places were required to have it up off the ground. And I don't mind doing that. Safety first in, in all things. Uh, you can actually see down to the left of the fire pit, the pot that I cooked my dinner in last night is actually sitting right there. <laughs> and that's an even larger one that's hanging up. It has the chicken, in, uh, chicken with fruit recipe in it. Um, but there are two chickens in that pot. Two nice big fat ones too. Uh, we use a tripod and we use little esks to raise and lower things depending on how hot we want it. So instead of having a gas mark or, or a uh, electrical thing on your stove, you raise and lower your pot to make it hotter or cooler. This is me at the New Hampshire Renaissance Fair, which is the first fair that I was involved in. And you'll note I'm wearing pretty much the same outfit that I'm wearing right now. It's one of my favorites. Um, we were working on um, a stew, I think, at the time. I'm looking, I'm seeing golden beets and purple carrots and a bunch of fruit. So probably stew. <laughs> and if you look in the lower left, you can see uh, some herbs there. We actually have a portable herb garden that goes with us both for show and so that we can use that in our cooking and we do. <laughs> These are some images from fairs that I've been at. Um, the center picture is a picture of a fire pit which is more correct for what they would have done in the Middle Ages. Um, the metal tripods that you're seeing are accurate but only the wealthiest people would have used them. Most people would have used a wooden tripod. Again, we don't do that because it's hard to lug that much wood around and because wood burns and all you need is to have one small accident and nobody has fun at fair. And the whole idea of this is to have fun. The top left image is a picture of our display table, which is showing our fresh vegetables. Uh, I can see leeks there, some broccoli, uh, carrots, and we have an assortment of nuts and herbs on display, a table set for a lord, and we have a box that contains extra plates and platters and such. And on the lower right, you can see I'm cutting up some purple carrots, uh, a parsnip, and those things that look like potatoes are not potatoes, they are actually golden beets. Beets were not red in the Middle Ages, they were colored, Today we call them golden beets, and I actually love working with them because they don't stain your clothes the way that the red ones do. <laughs> um, I can also see an apple there, and I've coined up a bunch of, uh, of leeks. We use a lot of leeks in our cooking as opposed to regular yellow onions because they grow so quickly, and I actually grow them myself, and I belong to a small farm co-op, and so I get uh, fresh leeks 
in bulk. Just to tout, blow my own horn here, this is the cookbook from which uh, the recipe is from. And um, I believe that Michelle has a recipe to share with you guys, uh, which I'm hoping she will. My cookbook is going to be on sale for $14.99 until I get the electronic version up. That will probably be around $5. But I've had technical issues with it. So for the moment, the soft cover is $14.99 and the hard cover is $29.99. And this is where you can find me on the web. I have a website which has, I think, um, it was posted a few minutes ago. I have uh, an Instagram, which is very random stuff that I post. My Facebook, which has all of my stuff about my books. My YouTube channel, where I talk about writing every Monday morning and then sort of random posts at other times. And I have, of course, my Amazon author page where you can see all of the books that I have written. All right. I'm going to stop this and see if I can get back. Did it unshare that? Are we back to normal? Yay! <laughs> um, so, yeah, I spent a lot of time dressed up like this and working over an open fire. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about that because the leading cause of death for women in the Middle Ages was death by fire. <laughs> I think you can see why when you have a fire pit that is large enough that you have to step into it in order to actually do anything, um, you risk getting your, your skirts on fire. And that's why we wear linen and wool and silk because those things are natural products and they don't continue to burn when you step out of the flames. Um, Things like rayon and some forms of blended cottons, um, polyester, <laughs> they all continue to burn when you step away, which is a bad, bad thing, and you don't want that. Um, but for instance, this gown, which uh, is kind of a beige color, is made of silk, but it's not shiny silk. It actually looks kind of like you would think like a linen washcloth or something, and it feels like linen. Um, it is unprocessed silk. It hasn't been made shiny. It's raw and it's very warm and insulating. So um, uh, next week I will be being interviewed for WMUR, which was a big surprise. And they're sending a cameraman over here and he's going to be watching me. So I'm going to be cooking outdoors and I will be wearing this gown and a cloak and that's it. And that is all I will need because it actually insulates so well and keeps me so warm that I don't need the extra layers. You might ask, how do I know this? Well, I know this because when you work New Hampshire Ren Fair, you are setting up your tents, usually on a Friday afternoon, the second weekend of May. And those of you who live in New Hampshire will know that the second weekend of May is a little bit persnickety when it comes to weather. Um, we've had snow. <laughs> We had snow one year. Uh, if we had been camping in 2020, we, could, we didn't because of uh, COVID, but if we had, we would have had six inches of snow. The person who owns the uh, property went out and took photographs for us and said, I'm kind of glad you weren't here because snowmageddon hit us. But we would have done it because we always do. Uh, there's been pelting, freezing rain, there's been sleet, but we've also had a couple of times when it's been 90 degrees and we've been sweltering. <laughs> and it frequently goes, we start out in the morning and it will be barely in the 40s. And by lunchtime, we're dealing with 90 and 100 degree weather. So you want to wear natural uh, linens and silks because it helps your body regulate its own temperature and you don't sweat to death or freeze to death which is kind of awesome. <laughs> um, so I don't know, do you want to hear a little bit about the cookbook itself and how I came to write that? That sounds great, Allison. All right. So I've been doing reenactment for about six years. It started out as a lark. A friend of mine asked me to come and help. Uh, they were short on bodies and they needed somebody to sit and they said, well, 
if you have a medieval costume, you can wear it. And I went, oh, I get to dress up. Yay. So off I went to the New Hampshire Ren Fair and I sat in a booth and told people all about whatever it was they had they had bunches of stuff and I had things to read and it was a lot of fun and then I found out that the New Hampshire Ren Fair is a nonprofit they actually take all of the money made at the door and through some of the vendors and that money goes to charity uh they uh, I think the first year I was there, we wrote a $65,000 check to Meals on Wheels and the New Hampshire Food Bank. It's amazing. And so I found out that and I was like, I have to be part of this. This is great. I get to do something for charity and I get to dress up and have fun. And so that's what I did. And then everybody was hungry. And I said, well, there's a big fire pit and I have cast iron. I'll just cook food. And that led to learning a little bit about medieval food and then learning a lot about medieval food and then irritating my family because you can't not try this stuff at home <laughs> before you take it out and try it on all the different people. Especially with medieval recipes. So you'll note when I posted and I started talking about the chicken recipe, I said I picked it because it tastes normal. And that's true. It does. It doesn't taste that much different from uh, the usual kind of um, uh, chicken that you would have in the past. However, let's see. Oh, well, here's one. This is one of my favorites. Chickpeas and sausage in almond milk. So I created this recipe myself, but it is based on several medieval Middle Eastern recipes, kind of all mashed together. Okay, so you have chickpeas and you have sausage, and then you have curry and almond milk, and sometimes I put in brown sugar or a sweetener, and cinnamon and cloves and nutmeg. <laughs> and so you end up with this almost sweet, and then there's spicy sausage in it. Um, there's another dish that I make, which is uh, a fried fish served with rice. And the rice is cooked in almond milk and honey. So what you end up with is this dish that is mercifully dairy free, which means I can eat it because <laughs> I can't do dairy, um, that tastes like rice pudding. If you threw a handful of raisins in there, you could serve it at any school cafeteria in the world. <laughs> it tastes like not quite as, I don't make it quite as sweet, but it, it tastes just like rice pudding. You have cooked rice and the almond milk, it thickens up, it gets nice and creamy. And then you sit this very savory fish, which has been cooked in garlic, onions, and olive oil over the top. And the first time I made it, I had a group of um, uh, the guys who hit each other with sticks while wearing heavy armor. They all come and eat at our uh, thing. So they were all, they all came over to see what I was cooking. And here I am busily pouring honey in and putting fish on top. And they're like, uh, I don't know. I don't know how that's going to taste. And so I put it out. I put a nice little picture of it. And it it's, looks pretty. And, and then they tasted it very trepidatiously. And then two minutes later, there were people facing people, other people, the fighters were facing each other off with daggers at the table, trying to get the last piece of fish and fighting over the scraps of rice in the bottom of the bowl. It takes people a little bit of time to get used to the way medieval flavors are. Now you can change it when you're cooking at home. If something sounds really good to you and then you look at the flavoring and you go, I don't think so, you can change it. And I do when I'm cooking for my family sometimes. But Sometimes it's fun to pull out what they would have pulled out so that you get that kind of taste of the past. And it looks different and it tastes different and it gives you something to talk to your kids about over dinner, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and it looks appetizing. Um, when you're dealing with medieval food, especially if you're looking at the lower echelons, the peasants and stuff, everything was boiled. Especially in England, everything was boiled. There's a reason tea comes from England. <laughs> so a poor house, by the way, medieval people ate two meals. They did not eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They had 
nothing for breakfast because when you woke up in the morning, you had to go to work either in the field or in a store or whatever you were doing. And your wife had to start the cooking. And I can tell you that when you're starting up a cook fire in the morning, it takes a couple of hours. I know this from personal experience. And it takes time. Breakfast was eaten at about 11 in the morning, which was when the food was ready. And that first meal was called um, supper. I remember rightly I have to actually look it up because I can never remember no dinner dinner is the midday meal and supper is the mid the evening meal um, dinner was the largest meal of the day you'd already worked several hours and you needed something to really fortify and it was frequently um, especially with farm families where they would set come out set up a big table under a cover or under a tree and everybody would sit down high and low alike and they would eat together and it was a massive meal all the food went on the table and you ate until you were foundering and then you would sit and relax for a little bit and then you would go back to work and you would work until you lost the light and then you'd come back and eat dinner and dinner was things that were easy to heat up pie from yesterday um leftover chicken from the day before you know whatever was there um they didn't do a lot of outside of the, the high royalty. They didn't do a lot of evening cooking. Most of that cooking was reserved for that midday meal. Um, in the mornings, if people were hungry, what they would do is take the leftover broth that the meats were cooked in the night before, and they would drink that, maybe with a piece of bread, maybe with a hunk of cheese, but even then, not, not very often. They learned very much not to eat in the mornings and that was it they would go off to work so we talk about breakfast being the most important meal of the day but that was not true for a very long time uh, that's a fairly new invention and i don't know <laughs> the medieval people weren't weren't quite as portly as those of us here <laughs> so um but i had been cooking all of these different recipes and i was pulling them up one at a time and just seeing you know what tasted good and what i liked and what i could get away with because again the flavors are different um medieval spicing was not based on flavor they did not choose what their spicing was going to be on how it tasted they based it on something called humors and I, having studied it for two years, still don't understand it well enough to do a good explanation. But basically, everybody was assumed to have these humors. You had um, hot and dry, wet, um, moist and dry, um, hot and moist and dry. And I, it, it's very complicated, but different spices like pepper, okay, would increase your heat. Um, dairy would increase your moisture. And so all these different ingredients were used. So if somebody was melancholy um, uh, or angry, choleric, that's a good word, um, they had too much spice in their life. So they would be like, well, you should eat oatmeal. You should eat bland foods. It'll calm you down. <laughs> and so all of the flavorings that you read about in these old recipes were based on that premise. Um, and the foods themselves as well. Um, what was the most outlandish thing that I have ever cooked? I've made haggis, <laughs> which is, it's not medieval. It's kind of early Renaissance period. It started around the 1700s, although I'm sure that they ate it before that. It's a sheep's stomach that is cleaned and scraped and filled with heart, liver, rice and like a whole bunch of other things and some spices and then you tie it closed and you make it into this big balloon shaped sausage and then it's boiled did i mention boiling everything is boiled <laughs> um yeah i will not eat that it's disgusting and gross uh, but a lot of people liked it and said it was very tasty and that they did a fine job at doing it um and I've also done some fish dishes. There's a couple of white fish dishes where you poach the fish. And so you take the fish and it's on this big long platter with holes in it. 
and you lower it into a boiling liquid or a simmering liquid and you simmer it for a long period at a very low temperature and then when it comes out it still looks raw it's not but it still looks raw. <laughs> I'm okay with that because I like sushi so I, I looked at it and it just looks like sushi but not everybody likes that and the texture is more like raw than cooked um, if you've ever cooked sous vide uh, which is the modern uh, thing that's going around basically it's like that so you don't get any of the browning you, you know but it is cooked it just doesn't taste or feel like it <laughs> I haven't done a whole lot of really outlandish stuff um, mostly because I, I don't want to waste food and so I work very hard to cook things that I at least have a chance of people eating um, and all of the recipes in my cookbook are things that I have um, tortured, I mean, test tested on my family. Uh, <laughs> so the, like, there's a whole bunch of different stuff in here. I'm looking at the recipe list in the front of the book. Um, and some of the funniest things have ended up being favorites around the house. The chicken with fruit has become something that we do. We did it at Thanksgiving. Uh, instead of doing a big turkey, we did a chicken uh, because there weren't that many of us, we didn't have enough people to warrant a huge turkey, and we had we that that we denuded that bird. All that was left was this little spindly skeleton in the bottom of the pot. Um, there's a lot of things were cooked in um, alcohol, so you have uh, a haddock in an ale sauce. There's uh, pork roast with egg and wine sauce. There's um, venison soup which has alcohol in it uh conies and syrup which is cooked in a, a red wine that is cooked until it turns into a syrup um lots of different and strange things um one of the coolest things which you might find i don't know if you've gone to the store looking for spam of late but it's almost impossible to find <laughs> I don't, there's a worldwide spam shortage. Who to thunk? Um, thank you, COVID. So I happen to like spam. Um, I grew up with it. My grandma used to slice it for afternoon tea. I have a Scottish background. So we used to have tea and sliced spam and tomatoes on toast. That was that was tea. And so I went to pick some up the other day. I didn't have any. I'm like, what? So one of the recipes in here is for a pork loaf. And when you serve it hot, it's like a pork meatloaf. And it's very tasty. Um, you just need to drain the fat off of it. And it it's just a, it's like almost like a sausage loaf. Um, but when you cool it, and the recipe is in there, they served it both ways. You can cool it, and it looks remarkably like spam when you're done. And that's exactly what it tastes like. So if you look at a recipe for spam, it's not actually all that different. The difference is that there's not a whole lot of um, bad things. There's no monosodium glutamate and that in mine. And it slices up just as nice. And so if you have a yen for spam, there's a recipe for it. <laughs> um, when I first pulled that out of the stove, everybody looked at it. It was another one of those ones where people were like, I don't know if I want to eat that. And I just kind of served it up and went, you're going to eat it anyway. I don't care. And they loved it. So. Um, Allison, is there a modern food you feel like you couldn't live without, even in your medieval cooking? Uh, yeah, grilled cheese. <laughs> I am a grilled cheese fan. And I can't do dairy. And it's taken me forever. And I finally found a cheese substitute that melts and tastes like cheddar and i'm so happy <laughs> so you wouldn't give that up even for period accuracy no no um uh medieval people didn't eat bacon and eggs the way we do as a breakfast food i mean they did eat them but mostly eggs were used in things as opposed to being used as they are like you didn't eat boiled eggs that i mean they did but it was not frequent so my crew is all like period history be damned we want breakfast <laughs> so <laughs> so we get up early i have a, i have a kid that does this with me and she starts the fire at ungodly o'clock in the morning so that i can actually make 
coffee and breast biscuits and and all that stuff and so we have what we call the um the, the cleanup breakfast so you take a big griddle um, and I have a huge one that sits over top of the entirety of my wooden of my uh, metal fire pit um, and you let that heat up and then you cook your bacon on it now you've got all that fat there now you pull all the bacon off and put it to the side and then you put your cook your eggs in the bacon fat so it's almost like poaching them which is terrifying when you think about the amount of fat that's in there but it's really tasty and then you pull the eggs out and then you take your bread and you slice your bread nice and thick and you flop it down onto the last of the bacon grease you don't need any butter or any bread because that bacon grease and the last bits of the egg and stuff all get caught up inside the bread and it toasts it and then you hand people their egg their piece of bread and their bacon and a bit of coffee and off they go and they're happy and the only thing I have to do to my cast iron at the end of that is give it a little wipe with a nice linen cloth and it's clean because <laughs> otherwise I got to go and scrub all of the bacon grease out and that's a hassle I'd say <laughs> Is there a medieval food that you wish more modern diners were aware of or an ingredient? Yes. There is a recipe and it's in my book. It's called Burian. Burian is a Middle Eastern 15th century meatball dish. So I use meatloaf mix from uh, Market Basket when I make it. But traditionally it was made with lamb and whatever else you had on hand, which probably meant that they used horse. <laughs> but I use meatloaf mix because I don't live in the Middle Ages. <laughs> so you make your meatballs up and you mix it up with um, egg and breadcrumbs and curry. And um, I usually use a fairly spicy curry because my family is into spicy stuff. And then while that's cooking, um, and you can just cook it in a fry pan with grease, um, you can you cook up eggplant and you mix eggplant that's been cooked until it's really, really soft and yogurt. I happen to use cashew yogurt, which tastes exactly the same as regular yo yogurt, but you can use regular yogurt or in a pinch sour cream um, and onion, garlic, cucumber, and I can't remember what else. I'd have to look it up. But you whiz it all together. Now, you can use a potato masher, which is what I use when I'm doing it on site. When I'm at home, sometimes I'll just stick it in the mix master because it's faster. Um, and then you take the sauce and you mix in Parmesan cheese if you want. And then you put the meatballs in and cook for the last few minutes. And it all gets mixed in together. And you serve it over cabbage or rice. And it's the most incredible flavor. If you've ever had... Um, baba ganoush the sauce is kind of like the baba ganoush the flavoring and stuff um but it's really good hot with the meatballs and it's awesome if you actually have any left over the next day for dipping veggies into and it's tasty and it's yummy and it's really good for you <laughs> well i hope to see that at my next potluck um ooh, cookware Okay, that's a whole other ball of wax. Cookware in the Middle Ages was kind of one of those cool um, things. Um, and goodbye to whoever was that left. I apologize. I missed that until just now. Um, but so when you're cooking over a fire, they didn't actually use cast iron at the time. Uh, what they used was beaten iron. But from a reenactor's perspective, we have at the moment one small, like it holds three cups of liquid, uh, beaten iron pot, and it's held together with rivets, and it's accurate to period. That cost me more than my period correct four-person canvas tent and all the hardware. <laughs> So we use cast iron because it's cheaper. Um, and as we're able, we add in little pieces here and there. But they would have had griddles, the same as we have, um, big flat pieces of iron uh, or soapstone, which would be heated up over a flame or over coals and you could cook on top of. Uh, they used pots that had legs, which could be lowered into the fire pit 
so I remember the picture that I had showing the pit, the big pit with the fire uh, and the over the top. Those pits, you build the fire at one end and then you actually drag the coals for cooking down to the other end. There's a, we actually have a thing called a coal puller, which is a big stick with a hook on the end. <laughs> and you step into the pit and you rake all of the coals down and you put them underneath and around the legs of the pot. And then if you're baking a pie, for instance, you can actually put them on the top of the pot as well if the pot is, if the lid is metal. Some pots back then, a lot of them only had wooden lids and you wouldn't want to put coals on that. <laughs> um, they also had things called a spider, which is kind of like a, a fry pan with legs, but really long spindly legs, about a foot long. And they had really long handles so that you could slide it into the fire and it would be up high enough that things didn't burn, and then you could pull it out without burning your hands. Um, and they used copper cookware, stone uh, ware um, that had been uh, carved like from soapstone and such. They also used uh, clay pots and ovens. Uh, I have a particular one that I like, that's called a tagine, um, which is, it's like a bowl on the bottom, and then it's got a top that looks like a little pyramid almost and you can put up like a half a chicken in this one it's just a two person it's small and you put your rice and your sauce on the bottom and then you bake it in the oven and it's kind of like a medieval version of a slow cooker almost um and then they had the same thing like we would have plates and things uh lower income people would have had wooden bowls and plates and such and people who had uh, more money would have had um, metal uh, right up into um, like the King of England would have had gold plates and platters. They would actually make them out of fine metals. And the decoration on some of those plates and platters are absolutely stunning. They're so beautiful. Um, and it's, it's, they still ate off of trenchers even the high class people, they would put the trencher onto their plates. And a trencher is a big piece of flat bread. It's a yeast bread, so it does rise, but they were made from a very tough dough. I have a recipe for them in the book. Um, and you cut off the top and you scoop out what's the soft interior, and then you scoop your meal into it. And they would eat the meat and the vegetables and whatever else was in there. And then that bread was taken from the high table of a duke or a duchess or king and queen and given to the poor. And the scraps of meat and uh, better quality vegetables was sometimes the best food that they would get. And it was frequently that that kept them alive. It's, it's a pretty neat thing. I actually wanted to talk about bread for just a second. Um, we talk about bread. Uh, you may have heard the term bread is the staff of life. Um, and that's, it's a very particular thing. Today, if you were to tell somebody, we're going to put them on bread and we're, I'm only going to feed my kid bread and water. They're, in, they're stuck in their room on bread and water. That would be cruel and unusual punishment. You'd get your kid taken away for doing that. Because Wonder Bread has absolutely no nutrients in it at all. They would die of malnutrition. Medieval bread had proteins, carbs, and fats in the bread that your body could access. So I actually use spelt when I'm baking bread, which is a very ancient form of grain. Uh, it's a type of wheat, but it's one of the earliest hybrid wheats. And when you bake with this stuff, your bread comes out much more dense. So it's like almost like a pumpernickel. It's so dense, but it has kind of a whole wheat flavor to it, a little bit more nutty. And that's more like what our ancestors would have been eating. Um, spelt was available freely. Um, it was being grown widely through Italy and Spain and by the, the 12th century. And it was being imported in bulk to England by that point. So, um, but that bread could keep someone alive. It was nutritionally adequate which is kind of a cool and different thing because we don't think of bread as being that way. We think of bread as being the thing which makes us fat. 
<laughs> but that's because our food today doesn't have nutrition. The quality of the, the things that you get from McDonald's or from a vending machine or any fast food place is not food. <laughs> it doesn't have, you, you know, if you look at the list of ingredients, the, the thing which it is purportedly, you know, it's a carrot casserole. Carrot might be the ninth thing on the list of ingredients. Whereas the foods that I'm cooking here uh, and they're in my cookbook are all whole foods. So while the things that I have in here are not diet foods, they're actually fairly diet friendly because you're not using a lot of um, fat. You're not using a lot of um, meat. The meat quality quantities are much lower than the standard American diet because meat was less ubiquitous at the time. So. <laughs> Speaking of meat, um, my coworker has asked me to ask this question. What's the deal with turkey legs? <laughs> okay, so turkey is an American thing. There were no turkeys in England until somewhere around 1505, uh, some intrepid explorer decided to bring some turkeys back to England and they bred them for a, a noble's rain, like their forest, and they got loose, and now there's turkeys everywhere. Um, but the reason that people, he, you, there are, it comes from a painting of King Henry VIII, if I remember it later. And it's not a period painting, but it shows him munching on the turkey leg. And so, at the time, like in the Middle Ages, they would have been eating capon. And capon, I use turkey in place of capon in recipes without blinking. Capon is a type of chicken, but it's kind of like the eunuch of chickens. They, they desexed them and then force fed them so they got really fat. <laughs> so they were more like turkeys in size. I mean, it was not unusual for them to be 12, 14 pounds. And that's a chicken. <laughs> they were huge. And so they would be roasted and everybody likes the legs. And so because turkey is such an inexpensive meat, it became kind of the, the Renaissance fair food of choice because it's inexpensive, everybody likes it, and it's portable because you can walk around with it in your hand and you look cool and you feel cool. And so it's kind of a feel good thing, but it is not historically accurate. <laughs> well, you learn something new every day. I'm gonna <laughs> open up for, for some last minute questions. So if you've got a question for Allison, don't miss out, put it in the chat. I'm sure she'd be happy to answer it. And while we're waiting for those last minute questions, I'm gonna get Allison to plug where you can find her uh, after this program on her website uh, and any other social media. I can put it up on the slideshow at the very end. Um. I'll flip it. But actually, maybe I can pull it this way. Aha. Technology is a wonderful thing, but only when it works. Okay. There you go. It is in the chat. Great, definitely check Allison out. And um, if you can read her book, it's available on Amazon and also through the library. Uh, don't forget to leave her a review if you enjoy the book. It's very important for local authors. Uh, and check out some of her other novels. She is also a fiction author who, who has some exciting other genres for you to check out, not just reenactment fiction or nonfiction. And here's a, a last question to end the night. Would cooks of the era cook dinner meals, breads, and desserts all at the same cookware or over the same fire? Um, yes, they would. 
if you've seen any of the the kind of um, Robin Hood movies and you see the bustling kitchen, or if you've watched Outlander and you've seen the kitchen at um, the main castle there, that is fairly accurate. They would have had a big kitchen and some of the larger houses, uh, the royal houses had more than one kitchen uh, simply because they had more staff to use them. Um, but it was not unusual. The only thing that you didn't see as much of in the Middle Ages being done at home is baking. Um, so farms out in the middle of nowhere would have baked their own bread, but anyone who was close enough to a city probably would have had a bread delivery because first, it's very not easy to cook bread with an open fire. I, I speak with the voice of experience. I make wonderful bread and I suck at doing it over an open fire. It's hard. Um, but also because by the 14th century, we had something called the wheat a size, uh, which was that loaves of bread that were sold were required to be exactly the same size. And they had a whole bunch of tax collectors who went around and measured the weight of bread to make sure that it had exactly the same amount of wheat in it. And so nobody wanted to mess with that because if you made a loaf of bread and, you know, sold it to your neighbor or traded it to your you could get in trouble. And it was big trouble. So they were very careful about that. Um, anybody who was near a city basically by the 14th century would have been buying. Um, and if you were living in a big city like London or Edinburgh, not every house had the ability to cook in it. And so there were street merchants everywhere. And a lot of people just bought their food and brought it home and ate it at home. So they had fast food too, but it just wasn't quite as fast as ours. That's all the questions I've seen in the chat. Thank you, Allison, so much for joining us tonight. Uh, and if you'd like to say any parting words. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed this thoroughly. I hope people found it interesting. And if you have any questions, um, Facebook is the best way to get a hold of me. If you go to my author page, I check that several times a day because I work from home and I'm sitting here in front of the computer anyway. So um, I'm happy to answer questions and to sit and chat. I really enjoyed talking. So thank you so much, everybody. Thanks to you as well, Allison, uh, and to all the participants who joined us today. And this, uh, again, is Michelle from the Gosstown Public Library. If you're interested in more events from the Gosstown Public Library, visit our calendar at gosstownlibrary.com to see what's coming up next. Uh, thank you for spending the evening with us tonight uh, and look forward to an email with the recipe from the earlier in the program next uh, early tomorrow morning. Thank you. Have a good night.